we have been previously talking a bit. And yeah, welcome everybody. This uh, talk will be on ethical design for well-being and effective health. So for those of you who are not from, from ET, we'll be just giving a, a brief introduction to what a research institution is, why are we doing this talk, and then we will give uh, the floor to, to Corina. So this will be just a couple of minutes, not to um, take some time from her. So ET is a, a private research center located in Valencia. We are currently almost 300 researchers and technologies here. Um, and we uh, have different uh, research areas at ET, which are all focused around um, the, the data cycle. So within our research area, which is human computer interaction, we focus on, on um, designing and evaluating technology to, uh, to make systems more useful and more comfortable to use for people. And we focus on different areas. Um, the main one in which we are currently working is uh, that of mental health and well, um, well-being, in which this uh, talk is, uh, is framed today. And some of the projects we have uh, currently been doing over the past three years are around um, immersive technology. So this was uh, our first project for um, autistic children in which they could use an app mobile phone with augmented reality just to practice at home activities that are usually difficult for them to, um, to perform and that, that, that they cannot do within the clinic. So therapists just um, edit in the application the kind of tasks that the, they want the children to practice at home and then the whole family gathers together and um, do um, kind of a, a gymkhana to pick augmented reality objects that uh, come up uh, around the house. Then we move to mixed reality, which uh, is this project from last year. And in here we focus on um, anxiety management using wearable sensors to capture um, the biofeedback from the user and mimic that within the application in which uh, the patient here sees um, uh, his or her emotional um, feelings uh, within this emotional avatar, like that mimics the breath and also the respiration, so the, so the heart rate. And that makes the avatar uh, change its shape so that the patient can reflect on, on his current status, emotional status. And then this year we are continuing with this work, um, the performing a platform uh, in which we are going to have different therapeutic activities aimed to different aspects of emotional regulation. So, for example, activities focused on calming an emotion, on identifying sensations or thoughts, and all these accompanied by the therapists that uh, are the ones who are giving us the input to, to design all these, uh, these applications. And within um, this discussion, we found um, Professor Sass and her research, which was uh, amazing to, to see and to, to learn from her. And we are hosting today a talk um, titled Ethical Design for Wellbeing and Effective Health. And just to give you a brief introduction of um, what Professor Sass has been doing, she's a, a professor in human computer interaction at the School of Computing and Communications at Lancaster University. She has been a technical program co-chair for ACMKI, which is, as some of you may know, the main conference uh, for human-computer interaction researchers in, in the world. She has also been um, co-chair of the doctoral consortium at this, which is another really, really important conference for us. She's also a member of the editorial boards of the ACM Transactions in Human-Computer Interaction. Uh, she has published over 200 papers having awards in, uh, in different areas and also uh, for excellence uh, in, in research leadership awards. She has led uh, two EC-funded uh, Marie Curie Innovative Training Networks and has supervised 14 PhD students. And in 2021, she was given the Outstanding Research Supervisor of the Year Award by the UK Times Higher Education. So um, just uh, to mention that this talk is hosted thanks to the ACM Distinguished Speakers Program. So ACM is the world's largest computing society, um, yeah, computer society, and they uh, allow researchers to, to host distinguished speakers from all around the world. So when we found that Corina was one of those speakers that gave their time to, to share her knowledge, um, we thought it was a, an incredible match and we are really, really happy to, to have her here today. So without further ado, I will stop sharing my screen and give uh, the floor to Corina. Thank you, Patricia. So let's see how can I get the presentation up.
All good? So we currently see the whole PowerPoint thing, so not just the slide. Is now? Can you see everything? Um, we see the whole window. I mean, if you just uh, want just a slide, we are seeing the whole a PowerPoint window with the mini slides on on the left as well. That's what you are sharing currently. Yeah, now we see just a slide. How is now? The same as before? Yeah. It's okay? Yeah. All good. All good. Okay, brilliant. So uh, thank you for the introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here with everybody today, even though it's remotely. So um, I will be sharing with you uh, a body of work I've done pretty much over the last 10 years with a rich network of collaborators, including my own research group at Lancaster. And um, most of this work has been focused on uh, trying to support uh, user experience, particularly emotional awareness and emotional regulation through a range of technologies. I want to talk about some research prototypes, which I'm putting here with the aim to inspire and provoke your thinking. Uh, we are using mobile apps, smart material interfaces, 3D printed food, as well as large displays. Now, obviously, ethics is a very important uh, aspect of uh, when we work with people with uh, uh, well-being or affective health concerns. So therefore, uh, it's something that we also looked quite closely at. And therefore, throughout the talk, I'm going to highlight key points where ethics has been a concern for us and how we we, we try to explore it. Um, so. Let me start with a, a brief overview of actually a, a rich body of work that took place in HCI. This is a, a systematic review we've done about four years ago, 2019 is a paper. Uh, we reviewed 139 papers and we look particularly at three um, affective conditions, which we know they are the most prevalent ones, depression, anxiety and bipolar. And um, um, this, this body of work was quite interesting. We found that most of the work in this space is focusing on data-driven systems. Uh, almost 45% of the papers, you can see them on the pie chart. This focus on sensing, collecting, displaying data for the purpose of cell tracking and also for the purpose of diagnosing uh, affective disorders. And in contrast, research on interventions or treatment has been less prevalent. Papers which are doing that are focusing on three main interventions, computerized CBT, mindfulness, and biofeedback. This is interesting because these are actually the, 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 the three type of interventions or uh, that, we, that we focus on in, terms, in, in order to support adaptive emotional regulation strategies, which was key to one of our European projects that, uh, that I coordinated. So um, another key finding, of course, with respect to ethics is that although these are all papers in the flagship HCI conference, uh, focusing on affective systems, right? People targeted by affective conditions. Uh, only one third of these papers mention ethics. The remaining two thirds do not even mention ethical concerns or values. From those that do, um, the key uh, ethical concerns are autonomy. This is uh, about the respect to um, for users' decision-making ability and their consent, and non-maleficence, which has to do with explicit intention of not harming. And we also identify a range of ethical concerns, which in the paper are quite uh, detailed at length, with a range of good practices that have emerged within the community to, to address these challenges. So first is diagnosis is highly problematic. So anything in, involving machine learning to, to provide diagnosis, for example, for, for people, is highly problematic. If it is, it, it, first of all, it perpetuates stigma and can also generate harm uh, when provided without support for the therapeutic assistance, right? You cannot necessarily give to somebody a diagnostic without giving also at the same time support. Most of these tools can be used for self-help and therefore these people might not be already part of the therapeutic alliance. Second, logging personal data can improve accuracy of the diagnosis and of course personalization of treatment, but data ownership remains very challenging and we do are in acute need of new models of data ownership. Third, involving users uh, um, is key for capturing their voice and ensuring autonomy, but also uh, the highly vulnerable ones, those who are suffering for, for, for uh, 
the severity of conditions is, is rather high, um, actually can be harmed by taking part in the research and therefore screening in order to safeguard them is quite important and therefore not to include them in, in, in research. And of course, the final point is there is an abundance of uh, personal data on public sites, social networking sites, Twitter and so forth, which, which offers a lot of potential for secondary data analysis. But issues of concern can still surface because people can be de-anonymized and therefore we still have to be mindful of the ethical implications of this, of this type of data. Um, so with respect to affective health technologies, we also looked at user acceptance and long-term use. This is important given that digital interventions, especially those for mental health, uh, such as mobile, mobile apps, tend to rely on long-term use, but many users discard them before the completion of the intervention. So in order to, uh, to address this, this, this challenge and to help designers design for long-term technology acceptance, we developed Technology Acceptance Toolkit, TAC Toolkit. This is a novel design tool for supporting reflection on user acceptance and its evolution across the entire user journey. From the pre-use, this is a stage that involves seeking advice and really contemplating choosing the tech, to initial acceptance during the first week of use, and until sustained acceptance. We're talking about a month or over a year of use. The Technology Acceptance Toolkit consists of 16 cards, three personas, three temporal cho multi-choice scenarios, a virtual thing space, and a website from where the cards can also be freely downloaded. So to design the cards, we used previous, a previous scoping review on the literature of user acceptance, where we proposed the technology acceptance lifestyle, life cycle model. And this articulates the different stages of technology acceptance and provides explicit and cohesive terminology because the literature in this space is really confusing. People use acceptance, uh, acceptability, adoption in a very uh, interchangeable way rather than with clear definitions. And we try to provide a little bit of clarity uh, on, this, uh, on this terminology. And for the TAC cards, we selected and operationalized several validated models, including our own. And from these models, then we're extracting 16 key acceptance factors, one for each card, which we also organize, as you can see, in uh, color-coded categories, using health for red, individuality and social context in orange, and technology in blue. This would make it easier for designers to, to, to learn them and to work with them. And we uh, explore, evaluated this toolkit with 21 digital health designers. And finding really show that while acceptance is a rather abstract construct, the toolkit help them uh, understand it in more concrete, accessible ways and increase, of course, designers' uh, awareness of their multiple factors of play. And we also show that addressing future acceptance issues can be challenging for designers. And therefore, the value of supporting designers to visualize future user experience is very important. So just want to highlight that it is this macro-temporal perspective of designing for user experience that has been particularly novel here, because it helps us think and design beyond one specific situated interaction, but within a broader temporal journey, right? Going beyond the first week of use, even before the initial use, first week of use and towards or beyond the first month of use, when actually different factors are at play to support users continue, continuing use. Okay, so uh, I will now illustrate some of our work on emotional awareness and regulation. And I'm presenting three design exemplars intended to, again, as I said, stimulate your thinking and hopefully inspire you. So let's start with Affective Health System. This is a system um, which has been um, uh, which has used uh, at the time is, is, is the work is rather old. It's been published in 2019, but has been uh, took place several years before that. I uh, used the Philips GSR sensor, which captured, of course, Havana skin response as a measure of physiological arousal, and also a very beautiful visualization on a mobile app, as you can see on the screen. Um, so the system actually uh, visualizes in real time changes in physiological arousal using colors, to, uh, more uh, warm colors to show increasing arousal, cooler color to show decrease, uh, lower arousal. And also there are people can tag different uh, different moments on that kind of temporal frame. They can zoom in, they can zoom out. It's beautiful, it's provocative, it's engaging type of interface. Uh, and then we evaluated it with 23 participants who use it for over a month as they learned the meaning of GSR. This is a, a, a less familiar sensor. 
As people try to make sense of the data, they build different interpretation of the visualizations for different purposes. For example, some of them use it for stress management, uh, others use it for sport performance, and other groups use it, use it for general life logging. But because GSR is a, is a less familiar type of uh, tracking, um, people engage in what we call proto-practices, uh, newly emerging practices. Uh, findings also highlight the value of ambiguity in this representation, which makes sense for proto practices. Now, we have we have um, the insights that actually, if we try to design for something which is not a proto practice, for a practice which is already developed, maybe the the the, um, the threshold of ambiguity has to be a little bit uh, differently thought about. But for this initial work, this level of ambiguity in the presentation in the representation worked well. Right, so now let's try to move away from traditional screen-based interfaces, which where most of the work took place. And for that, we start to explore smart material interfaces. Now, from those of you who work in the HDI community, you know that there is a the turn to materiality. Uh, and smart materials are an interesting starting point. They do offer a different range of constraints and affordances that uh, screen-based interfaces um, uh, fail to do. And because they do that, they can provoke us to challenge some of the assumptions we have when we design for screen-based interfaces. So that's why I really like to work a little bit with different materials, such as smart materials. So similar to affective health system that I've just described, uh, these smart material, smart material interfaces also involve biosensors. Uh, we work again with GSR, but we also work with heart, heart rate sensors. But what is different here, of course, we use with different range of actuators to support biofeedback. And I'm going to talk about this. The first one is um, we, build, we build both haptic and visual interfaces, but let me focus on the visual ones. So the, for the visual ones, we use thermochromic paints. This is quite an exciting material to work with. Uh, this, these are paints activated by heat. You have a three layer there in this, we use the digital fabrication approach, an insulation layer, you can see the black uh, wristband. Then there is a heat layer, which is like a metal conductive electricity. And on top of it, you have the thermochromic paint, which becomes activated by, by the heat. Based on this, the different shape of the conductive uh, heating element, the, the colors get activated in a similar shape. Here we have two prototype. One has like a show. Let me just see if I can start the video. One is, um, this is like a spiral. Starting it now. Can I run while I talk? Okay. And the other one is um, like a purple heart. Hopefully it's working. Um, and uh, as as um, arousal changes, the color change from uh, again from cooler color like like blue towards uh, green and then towards red, and then the heart shape also becomes from 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 pink to purple. Now um, we evaluated these prototypes in the lab with six participants. They all appreciated the ambiguity uh, because it's quite, they, you can see they very slowly unfold in front of your eyes, which, which support a certain level of engagement and provoke people to try to make sense of what's happening there. There is also a sense of slowness. So thermochromic material are slowly actuated materials, which is really interesting. So what's the slowness of the real time changes in arousal? And this is something that people also appreciated. But they would also would have liked to have control of the colors they are working with in order to personalize the meaning, potentially for more conspicuous use in public spaces. So they do not necessarily want to have red for high arousal. Um, and what we did next, um, we continue building other six prototypes, um, both visual and tactile. And here we have a screenshot of six of them. On the top row, you have those uh, in um, uh, in non-actuated states at the bottom in the actuated state. And you can see the first three are actually visual. Most of them, the two of them involve two colors, but the one in the middle involves three colors, red, yellow, and blue, representing high, medium, and low arousal. And on the right-hand side, we have three little prototypes involving haptic actuators, mini vibrator motors, which vibrate slightly when arousal is high, a shape memory alloy, nitinol spring, which gently squeezes the hand when, again, when you have increased in arousal, and um, a flexible conductive fiber generating warmth when arousal is high. 
And we evaluated these six prototypes with 12 participants who used them for a couple of days in the wild. And findings show again their role to, to prompt people to understand emotional responses, but also interestingly, increase their awareness of what is it's called in the literature affective chronometry in, in psychology of emotions. Affective chronometry, again, is how people experience emotions as they unfold in time. And um, findings show that people pay more attention to the self in the present. Um, they also manage to differentiate between discrete emotions, um, uh, which they initially uh, assign to different colors. And towards the end, they successfully link the colors to the intensity of the emotion, to the arousal, right? So they really move from, from the discrete model to kind of um, um, circumflex model of emotion, the two-dimensional emotion, they manage to differentiate balance and, and, and intensity and understand that the, the, the interfaces only represent intensity, not balance. So uh, haptic feedback were perceived as being more embodied. They were closer to the body, right? And they really felt the vibration, the heat, the squeeze, the squeeze, the gentle squeeze of the wrist. And the gradual increase in temperature was particularly expressive, made people pay attention immediately to what's happening there. This, this work led to four design implications. I'm going to very briefly uh, go through them. First, the awareness for the moment of increasing the arousal is best supported by haptic because they have this ability to capture attention. More. You, you can feel it even without looking at it, right? Haptic ones are immediate and perceived as embodied. But the decay of the emotional arousal, which is a key aspect of effective chronometry, and not just increase, but also decay, has been better supported by the thermochromic paint, which with, where the colors are still lingering. The deactuation of the thermochromic paint cannot be controlled. They have their own inertia of, of the color dissipated as the heat dissipates. Now, the heat in this heating layer cannot necessarily be controlled. I mean, you can you can activate it, but the way then it dissipates, it takes its own time to dissipate based on the the the, the width of the of the of the um, metal metal wire in, um, in that layer. That, but also what's important that, that is this slowness encourages reflection, really prompt people to look through and to make sense of their of their of their emotions unfolding in time. And also people appreciated the expressiveness of these interfaces. The three color one was particularly helpful, it wasn't just high and low arousal, but also medium level arousal. That was helpful, helpful for them to disambiguate. Uh, and as I already said, the uh, uh, haptic ones were particularly hedonic. Right, so we built we built a range of prototypes. I presented here about nine of them, and there was quite a lot in our labs. And then we think, okay, so what can we do with these prototypes? We know that people like to personalize their affective displays because we saw that in, in our initial initial evaluation study. So then we decided to actually deconstruct everything we built and then use these materials to build a, a toolkit. Uh, and we built thermopixels, which uses thermochromic paints to help people design their own affective interfaces. Now, this is interesting because, of course, it's it's it's, it's we, most of the affective interfaces, particularly the, the screen-based ones, such as those on smartwatches or on our phones, are black ready-made black box devices. People cannot do much with them. But in our case, we want them to actually try to understand how they can build. We know that by building every, every DIY practices support agency, personalization, adoption, and attachment to devices. So it's a really interesting direction to move forward. And the toolkit consists of thermochromic paint sheet. You can see this on the on the top left. We, we, here we don't have haptics, right? Because haptics have been a little bit more challenging, but we started with this, this type of material. We have heating materials such as heating pads, nichrome wire, beltier elements, conductive fiber on the top right, GSR sensors on the bottom left, insulation material on the bottom center, and uh, a range of supporting tools on the bottom right. Here we have, you can see paint brushes, syringes, paint spreader to apply paints and so forth. Um, we evaluated this with 20 participants using co-design workshops. We have 11 males and nine females, and none of them have expertise in neither in biosensors nor on thermochromic paint. So we really wanted to work with novice, novice users. Each workshop consisting of three parts. You can see on the left hand side of the slide the, the, method, the study methodology. The first part, we just ask them to sketch representation of emotional arousal using pa paper and pencils, no thermochromic colors. The second, we introduce them to the thermopixel kit and we let them explore it. One, they understood how the materials work. Uh, we proceed with uh, supporting them to build a prototype that they actually 
design in the first stage. So try which color they would like to use for what and which shape, which visualization for, for increase of arousal or decrease of arousal. And then we gave them to use these prototypes um, in, a, in, a, in a third part of the study. Um, and we, we try to, of course, uh, engineer emotional responses. We provide them with a set of images eliciting arousal so they could observe in real time how actuation of their developed prototypes work. And then we conducted interviews and asked participants about the experience of using the toolkit, uh, designing it and making the prototypes and interacting with them. Right, so thermopixels uh, allow novice users to design and build rather complex technologies such as affective interfaces, allow them to use their bodies in the process to actually actuate the device. Some of them, even before we evaluated it, they start to move around to, to really try and increase their arousal to see how the prototype becomes actuated. And all of them uh, were really keen to express themselves through these prototypes, right, to personalize. And you, some of them even use it for some creative expressions. Um, so, a key finding is that we've actually identified two distinct motivations for designing such interfaces. Some of the users designing primarily for awareness. So they were using, for example, red colors, uh, sharp shapes to represent increase in arousal and uh, more blue, green colors and round shapes to represent um, uh, well, actually, they represented just increase of arousal with red colors. Okay, and the other group were more focused for, was more focused on affect regulation. They didn't try to represent increase of arousal through red colors. They were using round shapes and more muted colors like green or blue, right? Cooler, cooler colors. And another interesting thing is that actually this, these two motivations and these two different way of representing um, their representations on their affective interfaces was very gendered. Um, and all of them enjoy the fact that they could personalize. And this personalization was perceived as being highly, highly uh, rewarded for participants. And by working with the prototypes and building them, they develop a richer, we can say even more visceral understanding of what arousal is. And there are many quotes in the paper to support this statement. And actually, some of them, most of them would have liked to continue using, using the device after the workshop. Of course, it wasn't as a stage to, for us to allow them to do that. It was still a, a very flimsy prototype, but they were quite keen to do it, which, which you know is the case when people in, engage in DIY practices. There is a strong attachment being developed. OK, so um, now let, what I talked so far, I, I cover a couple of prototypes about emotional aware, awareness. We can see that emotional regulation also starts to happen even with prototypes who support emotional awareness. But emotional regulation per se hasn't been actively supported in the prototypes I've already spoken. They, they, are, they are happening organically as people interact with them. And I'm going to talk about a range of technologies where we are focusing more specifically on how to support regulation itself as well, beyond just awareness. So I'm going to talk now about some haptic interfaces that we built, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the others as well, if time allows. So let me start with some um, vibrotactile and thermal interfaces. So again, we built on the well-known preference of for personalization of affective interfaces and look to, to see how affect regulation technologies can also be personalized. So how can we actually co-design such personalized interfaces? Now, in terms of the modality, we choose to use haptic because we have seen in the previous work they are more embodied and do not demand visual attention, right? This is quite important because in the wild, uh, visual attention is a very scarce, scarce resource. You don't want to really uh, exhaust it by demanding people to look at on their screen interfaces all the time. So uh, we're conducting a study which consisted consisting of two parts. The first part, about half of the participants, this is our haptic group, uh, we asked them to create these personalized vibrotactile and thermal patterns for affect regulation. So again, we don't know, we didn't know exactly which one, which of these soup haptic modalities to go for, vibrotactile or thermal. So therefore, we explore them both and really try to compare how how they how they work. And for this for this initial stage of the study, we use two commercial wrist-worn devices. One provides precise localized thermal sensation uh, on the top of the screen, and the other one. Uh, pro delivers uh, vibrations uh, at the bottom bottom uh, of, the, of the image. 
Each actuator can be connected to a mobile application through which participants could explore and change parameters. Now, the design space has not been particularly fast, but nevertheless, people could change some of the parameters. For temperature, they can change the intensity between minus 11 uh, degrees Celsius to plus 16 from user's baseline temperature. And for uh, vibration, they can change vibration frequency from 30 to 185 bits per minute and vibration intensity. This is between 5% to 100% from, from the baseline. So we gave them to build this um, this pattern to design this pattern as and we give them the instructions if you are to be uh, to be stressed what kind of patterns you like to experience in order to help you regulate stress and in the second part the haptic group received their own personalized patterns on the wrist during a stressor task and the control group uh, which did not create uh, any patterns do not receive did not receive any haptic feedback but they're also exposed to the same stressor task and we measured the, the stress using the Validated scale like the stage trait anxiety inventory, and we also measure HRV data from all participants, and then we follow up with the interviews to explore the experience. Okay, overall, the findings show that haptic patterns, both of them, either vibrotactile or thermal, significantly lower both subjective and objective stress level for the haptic group compared to the control group, which receive no patterns. Now, for the vibrotractile patterns, most participants created low frequency vibration. You can see on the top of the slide, um, uh, we had about eight participants uh, who chose these patterns. Six, uh, sorry, six. Right. So you can see most of them created low vibration frequency around 30 bits per minute. Then rather one than, than, than high ones and uh, this and associated them with their heart rate. Right, so this low frequency vibration would represent a slow target heart rate, which they would need in order to calm down, as you can see in this quote. Some of them would have liked to go even lower than 30. The system did not allow them, but there is this kind of increasing um, uh, attraction towards lower heart rate when people are stressed in order to regulate. And then for the for the Thermal patterns, actually, we found some more distinct uh, subgroups here. Half of the participants design, ter design thermal patterns by increasing the temperature between 2 to 10 degrees. We have it here on the right hand side. Um, and um, these participants refer to the pattern of warm uh, as being helpful, helping them, but they did not like to go higher because hot would have become problematic in order to regulate. And the remaining people uh, were actually choosing cooler. Uh, uh, lower temperature between minus eight my, minus eleven from their current temperature, and they reporting this feeling of coolness as being unique and unfamiliar. The feeling of warmth is comforting, resembling human touch. So you can see that we have two ways, and each, both of these two ways of using temperature um, can be mapped to different metaphors we use in order to regulate. We choose temperature as well, right? You are hot under the color, or you want to cool down. You can see we use all these metaphors for regulation as well. So um, our findings in, um, our findings suggest highlight the, the value of supporting this implicit affect regulation, right? This is unconscious cognition with no specific actions through entrainment of slow bodily rhythm, such as heart beating, right? But the two modalities have different strengths. The low frequency vibration supported entrainment. This is clearly through, through the interview. Um, but the thermal feedback supported something more expressive and hedonic, not entrainment, right? It is not a synchronization of with the, with the bodily rhythm. But nevertheless, we suggest there is a value of leveraging both modalities. We can use thermal patterns which can uh, involve rhythmic patterns, such as pulsating warmth. So therefore, this can support rhythmic entrainment. Uh, aligned to, for example, to have lower heart rate, but also adds this hedonic quality that the haptic feedback support. Um, so, and of course, people deeply enjoy the personalization and would have liked that these adaptive patterns also change in time. They only have one pattern for the entire duration of the of the stressor task, but would have liked those patterns to also change as the level of stress changes. So, dynamically adaptive patterns might be an interesting future research direction. Right, so how are we doing with time? Uh, okay, I think we're doing fine. So, right, so 3D printed flavors. I'm going to go through this. Uh, this is an interesting body of work. Um, 
We look at food as a as another resource for design. Why right? food is really an interesting material to work with. It's highly emotional, sense rich in sensory qualities. But without any 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 doubt, bears a lot of value on our emotional regulation. Now, whether it's 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 adaptive regulation or maladaptive, it's a different thing. But we eat to to comfort our emotions, right? Uh, and this is this work is part of a larger project where did, we are really looking at it uh, of, of understanding eating experiences from the perspective of human food interaction. Just as a as a, as a background, we, we we conducted recently a systematic review of over 100 papers in human food interaction from the lens of eating experiences. And the emerging trend here is that we are actually moving from taste stimulation. Uh, most of the work is taste stimulation towards supporting multi-sensory flavor experiences, right? With flavor, you don't have just taste, you have smell, you have lots of other, all other uh, 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 sensory modalities being being stimulated. Um, so, and also there is, there is a trend, an upcoming trend of moving beyond the predominant external stimulation, right? So you can have electricity, for example, on a tongue in order to augment specific sensory modalities and, and, and taste, taste, but for particularly taste, to both external and internal sensory stimulation. And not just to sen for sensory stimulation, but also for sensory deprivation. And I'm going to briefly touch on that. So um, to explore the value of food for emotional communication and regulation, especially in intimate relationships, we develop a sensory probe kit, uh, which consists of, uh, on the right-hand side, you can see a range of materials. We have here things which can augment or deprive our sensory modalities. For example, ear plug, blindfold, gloves for sensory augmentation or deprivation. We also have a food diary. And also on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see a game board associating flavors with evocative images. These are intended to provoke and sensitize. Right, so what we did, we worked with five romantic couples. We gave them this toolkit uh, with which they engaged for at least a week, if I remember correctly. Um, and this was about to sensitize them to their eating experiences. And then in the second part of the study, we engaged them in a co-design process to design 3D printed flavors for emotional expression and co-regulation. So we asked them to think about five flavors that they would like to design to express happiness, sadness, an emotional neutral expression, like, for example, saying hi, and two flavors to co-regulate their partners, to cheer them up or to calm them down. These flavors were built by the first author in this study, Tom Geller. He was my PhD student at the time. Um, and they were uh, revised with feedback from participants. And in the second stage, we deployed them together with a 3D printed um, 3D print, printing technology in people's home for a couple of days uh, and asked them to engage with these probes. Right, uh, findings show that these 3D printed flavors supported expressivity, physicality, joint action, and gift giving. All this shown um, support for technological immediate connectedness. Now, in terms of regulation, cheering up was the most common one for using the printer. Eight out of 10 uh, such printed flavors involving chocolate chocolate-based printed uh, printed flavors. For calming, calming down, people use uh, particularly drinks or juices or teas. Um, a finding also showed that the value of 3D printer flavors to support two important intimacy rituals. This was end of day ritual and the evening meal. And we discussed the value of our findings for remembered and imagined positive flavors, and also the value of integrating them in these such focal practices for supporting emotion co-regulation. And further on, we work with 12 elderly participants. We use the same methodology and we try to develop 3D printed flavor as memory cues. Um, at, at this stage, again, in the first stage, we gave them the kit. In the second stage, we asked them to co-design flavors for prompting recall of these self-defining memories, which we call they are very important memories, which are part of our sense of identity, which actually in old age and uh, when, when unfortunately people are starting to experience, for example, dementia, this this self and memory, this sense of self is disintegrated, self self defining memories become weaker, right? So it's quite important to be able to support them. Uh, and then we ask them to think about um, specific flavors which might cue these self defining memories. Some of them are said involving food, some of them not involving food. And then we created these flavors together with them, co design them, and then. We use these flavors to 
see the value of these flavors from prompting their recall. So it's quite a complex design. I'm not going to insist much on it. All I want to say that findings show that 78% of the memories prompted by the flavor-based cues were recalled with intense feelings of being brought back in time. This is quintessential memory time travel, right? Uh, and they also have strong positive effect and rich sens sensorial richness. This is very important. And we really discuss the value of these technologies for um, as a flexible resource for design of memory technologies, integrating again, uh, moving beyond uh, moving beyond the traditional memory technologies, right? Using 3D printing ones, 3D printing ones. I'm very mindful of the time. I'm not going to insist much on digital well-being. Um, we just try to explore how we can regulate overuse of phones and uh, did a review of, of some commercial apps, also a, a set of them from academia. I can tell you that the basic thing is that all of these apps by, by large are focusing on creating obstacles to limit phone use uh, through a range of things, blocking the phone, creating sc different screens. Um, uh, but they do not necessarily address the fundamental problems of, of of, um, well, most of them, first of all, people discontinue you straight away, as is the case with many apps. And I think the, the argument we're trying to say that there is a lot of potential trying to move away from limiting meaningless use towards more meaningful use, right? So it's, this will support approach motivation rather than avoidance motivation. And this is a research direction that can really benefit from the increasing body of work in HCI on mindfulness technologies. We did quite a bit of work in mindfulness. It's not part of this talk. But uh, there is a growing body of work on that as well. And we also did quite a bit of work on depression apps, trying to understand them, mostly commercial apps. Um, uh, we, we look at over 350 apps on Marketplace and their description. And uh, again, a very important thing is that uh, most of these apps appear to be evidence informed, but there is issues with their research evidence and with fit with clinical guidelines, right? Uh, and we did not find any app to fully align their treatment with clinical guidelines. So this is quite an important, important thing about depression apps. And we also looked beyond app descriptions and analyzed users' reviews of such apps uh, and to really understand their ethical issues. So this is very relevant for this talk. And we uh, conducted a thematic analysis of over 2,000 user reviews from 40 depression apps in Google and Apple Store. And again, Users reported a range of both positive and negative experience, and of course, strong ethical implication, particularly for the negative ones. Key things here are potential for misdiagnosis. You can see I touched on this at the beginning of my talk. The harmful advice, especially through peer support, this, this is really, really concerning. The paper provides a lot of, a lot of support for, for this finding and is really concerning. And we really try to highlight the importance of addressing this in some way. Uh, again, Rather concerning, most reviews highlighted major usability issues, which is really interesting. I mean, at this state of age, we expect that apps do not necessarily have usability issues, but they do have. And when they are depression apps, when these people already struggle with, with mental health issues, usability issues, can usability concerns can be really, really problematic and harmful. And again, we have concerns about validity, safety, accuracy of the data, um, like, like for many, many, many similar reviews. Uh, uh, I just want to say, we also try to organize these findings into an ethical framework, integrating biomedical and virtue ethics, um, and the paper unpacks this in, in greater depth, so I'm not going to go through this. I'm just going to conclude with the final one. Um, this is, um, uh, we use large displays and we look at dementia care. Now, um, this part is part of a larger project. We really try to see how we can support stimulation in old age, sensory, cognitive, social and emotional. And again, try to move beyond the small screens. We know many care homes have tablets where care staff works with uh, with, with specific uh, with elderies in order to support their memories. Um, but um, um, very few work is done on large displays. So uh, we and large displays have potential affordances to support richer cognitive and sensory stimulation, right? There is almost a sense of immersion that they provide. The paper really unpacks this in greater depth. I'm not going to insist on that. But what I want to say, we build this dementia wall, which is consists of uh, nine high quality large displays. You can see them in these pictures, arranged in an L-shaped grid, which we deploy for over a year in a residential care home. 
the display um, shown content curated by the care staff from uh, most of videos from YouTube. They choose content to match users' needs in the moment, the residential needs. These are people with most of them with advanced dementia. And finding indicated four novel psychosocial interventions uh, that dementia were supported for sensory, emotional, social, and cognitive stimulation. And I'm going to briefly talk on two of them. One is about bringing to life no longer accessible experiences, such as being in a cinema, restaurant, or church, because these people could no longer travel, right? So they feel like they're almost there, this sense of immersion. And another one, which which is particularly relevant for this talk, is um, mood and behavior regulation uh, using nature-inspired media. So content such as nature-based videos, but mostly most of them were seascapes and forest landscapes, were sourced from YouTube, as I said, by the care, care, the care staff, who took this active role in, 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 in curating the content to really match the residents' needs. What we've seen most were videos of sunny white beaches, waves breaking gently on the shore. And you can see this powerful quote. Most of these people um, suffer from fidgeting, agitation, particularly in the evening. And you can see this is a powerful quote showing like with severe dementia, there is a lot of walking so that one resident almost exhausts herself. But with the right image, she would relax almost instantaneously. Shoulders would drop and she would sit and look at the screen. So that was that was what I want to say about uh, about the dementia wall. And here I'm I'm acknowledging the amazing uh, students uh, I had the pleasure to work with on the top row and uh, collaborators, academic colleagues on the bottom row. I'm very happy now to stop the presentation and to um, take your questions. I think I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Thanks, Thanks Corina. Corina. It's, been, it's been amazing, amazing presentation. presentation. Do you have any questions in the room? You can either unmute yourselves or write them in the chat. If not, I have a couple of questions yeah. myself, so. <laughs> People still decide whether they want to talk or write. The, uh, you were mentioning um, the workshops you have done. Uh, have you done any uh, workshops or or um, co-design studies with uh, psychologists or therapists to to, for example, know how the, the, their perspective could could be in this matter? How they could start using these kind of applications within their practice? Uh, we did work with, with therapists, not in the workshops I described in these presentations. They were mostly for co-designing with users mm -hmm. or more exploratory. Um, but we do have, we do work quite closely with, with, with counselor, therapists and collaborators in, in various projects that we have, but not described in this paper. Um, yeah, often we use interdisciplinary workshops where we have at least one 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 person who who has uh, clinical expertise to be able to shape the understanding of what's happening with with people, for example, designers or or HCI researchers. So yeah, this is this is a this is a definitely a very recommended approach to to be sure that we cover all the caveats that need to be covered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was also curious about because uh, you mentioned that there the participants in those uh, in those workshops were people who who had not previously used any kind of of technologies or those kind of affordances. Were they familiar with uh, any mental health issues or with um, emotional regulation at all, or was that a new concept for them? Like. So we will we'll explain them if you, if you are stressed, how you like to calm down. So we of course we communicated what what the key we, we didn't use academic jargon to to do that. We make it accessible. When they were representing arousal, we just say how would you like to represent arousal. Uh, again, we explain what are increasing emotion, intensity of emotion, how we like to represent, and we give them you know the colors and pencils and then did design shapes and uh, use red for sharp shapes or something for arousal. Um, again, we try to make it accessible. We want to see how end users with that expertise. We really like to, I think there is a scope for, for millennials, for even even for potential autistic children to use such technology. So we want it to be done just, just from grassroots, bottom up, not necessarily with any kind of um, 
Well, we build on previous work and we know how to how to support these, these things. And I don't think it was necessarily an issue of having a therapist in that specific process because it's what works for them. They want this creative mm -hmm. exploration and expression. Yeah. This came from the previous study, the idea that they would like to personalize the representation. So that's exactly what we wanted to do. But in other, if we try to develop a specific intervention, then definitely there you need, a, you need clinical input. Mm -hmm. Okay, can we get another question? I think I like to hear a very silly question. <laughs> if I may ask, I, I would like to yeah, expand please. a little bit on, on the arousal. I was wondering if any user missed uh, the ability of distinguish or represent differently uh, an arousal that is positive, like a present surprise uh, with an arousal that might be negative, like I'm suddenly upset about yeah, yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. They did that, they did that, they do that a lot. Uh, so when they have the prototypes, they really experiment with that. They they try and then they then they start seeing a part and okay, so the color red doesn't appear only when I'm angry, it also appears when I'm happy. And then they start to try. There is there is a it really provokes reflection and 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 pattern identification, right? This is all about supporting self-awareness. That's happening. And and through that they managed to understand. Okay, so it's not well. They don't. They didn't say it in this work, but it's not a balance. It is the arousal that's constant between these two emotions. This is the high intensity. But I think, as I said before, when the, the three colors were provided, even though they only use it for a couple of days, these prototypes, they all most of them managed to, to decouple the discrete emotions from their uh, arousal and violence in complex model. Right? So they are completely different models. We think in discrete emotions as folk psychology, discrete emotions. And it's quite hard to think about in dimensions, but they managed to do it. But the three color prototype with visual visualization was actually more helpful, allow them quicker to support this, the, the ambiguation. And sometimes they even experiment and they try to run with it. They put it on a window that, you know, they, they, they do all kinds because it's a black box at that stage. They don't know what 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 we didn't tell them what's happening, but they, they, they do engage. And of course, sometimes they can project meaning what's happening. Uh, but by default, they, by, by most of them managed to get that, which I think it was quite interesting that they managed to understand that. Okay, then we get a very silly question. I'm very happy to entertain a very silly question. Come on, I mean, it's almost midday. You have to be awake at this moment. <laughs> Karina, if I, if I may ask, um, I found really interesting that you mentioned the personalization because it's, uh, did anybody say something? Yes, uh -oh. I, yes, oh, yeah. me, Eva Cerezo. <laughs> yeah. yes. Hi, Eva. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I was wondering if you could uh, explain a little bit more. I was so interested in the dementia issue in the residence, in the care, special care facility. What was their reaction if they tried somehow to interact with what was uh, proposed to them or so? What, how was the reactions of the people there? Okay, so um, depends what being shown. And as I said, it was what was shown matched what people were needing. So for example, if it was towards the evening, something more calm, like the, the thing which I described. Uh, and then they were just sitting there and they kind of, losing and you know, staying calm and not not fidgeting but if for example it was um something that they would like to increase the mood in the room to act actuate to activate the mood i don't know uh before lunch or something like that they could have put something a bit more rhythmic they, they also use music but on the screen they could have put some dance some dance from before the war or whatever because these people are in their 70s 80s well, they're only women resident and then they become more animated. This is because it's so big. It's almost it's almost full size. It's it's human size. Everything. It's big. People, silhouettes, horses, everything. Sometimes they will there try was to go. There were people also projected there. There were person also in the videos and so also. Yeah, yeah. The videos. It's video content. It's from YouTube. It's mm -hmm. nothing super super. It's not it's not creative content for them. It's just source. But they were keep and trying and they see what resonates. But sometimes people, people residents will even try to reach a flower or something. You know, there is a sense of, or sometimes even getting and dancing. <laughs> it was quite, quite, quite engaging in that way. Yeah. And sometimes they also use it just to, you know, pictures during the, again, post-war post, post -war, 
way of clothing, way of cooking, uh, household activities, just to to go back to to the younger self in a way, or they were children at the time, just to to go and rebuild some of those memories and uh, conversations being supported, like like a collective reminiscing that help, 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 help happened as well. But that was cognitive and memory stimulation. I chuckled a little bit more about the emotions here because I was sort of trying to, to target the aspect of co-regulation that happens through the displays. Yeah, and those displays were so used that at the end of the study, we didn't take them out. They were quite expensive, they were about over 20K. But I would not have been fair to take them out because they became part of the fabric of the of the house of the residential care home. So we decided to let them there until we find an, another cheaper way to support it. We didn't, but you can use projectors to do it. It's much low cost effective. But it became it became so much part of the residents' home. You you cannot take it out. It would have been unethical. Thank you for the question. So I think with that, we are right on time for finishing. So we were supposed to finish at 12 and it's, uh, it's 12 o'clock. Thank you so much, Corina. We cannot stress how how uh, wonderful has been this talk for us and for having you here. Thank you very much. A great Thanks pleasure. all for, for assisting. Um, would you probably receive um, the recording afterwards? So the link will be sent to all of you who register. And if you have any further questions, please let us know. So thanks again, Great. Corina. Thank you so Great much. My pleasure. Lovely to see you all. Take care. Bye. Bye thank for now. now. Thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye, Corina. Bye.